And now for chapter three, radiation characteristics. Learning objectives for this chapter is going to be to define the key terms associated with radiation characteristics, to describe the effect that the kilo voltage has on the quality of the x-ray beam, and identify the range of kilo voltage required for dental imaging, to describe how kilo voltage affects the density and contrast of the image, describe how milliamperage influences the quantity of the x-ray beam, and identify the range of milliamperage required for dental imaging. Describe how milliamperage affects the density of the image and how exposure time and milliamperage are related. Describe how kilovoltage, milliamperage, exposure time, and source to receptor distance influence the intensity of the x-ray beam. Calculate an example of radiation intensity using the inverse square law and explain how the half value layer determines the penetrating quality of the x-ray beam. All right, so the purpose of this chapter is going to be to understand the concepts of the x-ray beam quality and quantity. You're going to hear these words quality and quantity very often in this chapter, and I'll try to refresh you on them later. But these two concepts, quality and quantity, will probably be on your board exams. So this is an important thing to keep in mind. We're going to define the concept of the beam intensity which is also related to quality and quantity. And then we're going to discuss how those exposure factors influence these uh, radiation characteristics. So how exposure factors influence quality and quantity. The first part we're gonna talk about is quality. And this has a lot to do with how, uh, how sharp of an image, how good of a diagnostic radiograph that we have taken. And so this has a lot to do with your kilovoltage and voltage, the KVP setting on your on your um, control panel, the density and the kilovoltage peak, the contrast with your kilovoltage peak, and then the exposure time. So we're going to be talking a lot about kilovoltage and we're going to be talking about it in relation to density, contrast, and exposure time. Okay, so remember how before we talked about um, we wanted to filter out with those aluminum filters the shorter, I'm not sorry, short, uh, longer wavelengths, those ones that were less penetrating, the ones that had less power. That is because um, we want those short wavelengths, we want those strong, penetrating, fast moving uh, wavelengths so that we can get a good quality. The wavelength, the, the distance between um, the crest of one wave to the, the crest of the next wave is going to determine its penetrating power. Shorter wavelengths have more penetrating power. Um, the quality is used to describe the mean energy or penetrating ability of the x-ray beam. So quality tells us how strong the x-ray beam is, and that's going to determine how good of a radiograph we get. The quality is going to be controlled by kilovoltage. Kilovoltage is how much power we're putting through that um, that x-ray beam so that we can get a more strong, uh, more penetrating, and a shorter wavelength x-ray beam. Okay, so remember that we measure these in uh, voltage, but kilovoltage is just 1,000 volts, right? So um, the voltage is something that we'll, you'll definitely see on your board exam and that how voltage plays a role in the quality of the x-ray beam. The potential difference between two electrical charges when voltage is increased, the speed of the electron increases. The electrons strike that target with a greater force and a greater energy and they end up that photon that is created is moving much faster because of how hard those electrons hit that tungsten target in the anode. All right, so voltage, like I said, is measured in volts or kilovolts. Kilovolts is just 1,000 volts. Well, I guess we are jumping the gun here. The unit of measurement used to describe the potential that drives an electrical current through a circuit. The dental radiography requires the use of 65 to 100 kilovolts. So when you see this on a test question or a board exam, it's going to be 65,000 to 100,000 
volts or 65 to 100 kilo volts, right? Because there's a, a thousand difference there. Less than 65 kilovolts is going to give us a uh, very lazy, very long, uh, completely unpenetrating uh, x-ray beams. And then if we go too many, we have um, over 1000 kilovolts, then that means our x-ray is going to actually show up, our radiograph is going to show up way too dark. We're going to have way too much uh, penetration and we'll go uh, not we'll be penetrating things that we we don't necessarily want to be penetrating so um that sounds really that sounds really horrible but um essentially we would have too much power and that would not be good for our patient or even for our sensors or for our radiographs that last slide actually when i went back and listened to it it makes me sound, uh, think of that movie where um it's that acapella group they're all girls and they uh, the one of them is like not a good enough reason to use the word penetrate. <laughs> I, uh, I definitely had a moment there. Anyway, kilovoltage peak is the maximum or peak voltage. This usually refers to the peak voltage of an alternating current, right? The one that goes back and forth, not the one that just moves in one direction like direct current does. Um, this is a polychromatic x-ray beam. Um, is produced as a result of varying kilovoltages in the tube current. And what that means is that we get X-ray beams that are traveling at very different types of wavelengths. The quality or wavelength and energy of the X-ray beam is controlled by kilovoltage peak. Right? That's the that is if we if we have too much variation in our kil kilovoltage peak, then we have a lot of different speeds that our waves are all going to be traveling at and many of them are going to get filtered out uh, but the ones that are come through will still be in very uh, varying wavelengths um, whereas um, when we have a direct current and we have a very consistent kilovoltage peak then we get uh, wavelengths that are all traveling at the same speed. And then the kilovoltage peak, KVP, is actually the setting that we're going to use to uh, change on our control panels. And that is the setting and the, the acronym there that you're going to see most often. Okay, so you're gonna hear this word density for probably the rest of your career. Density refers to how dark your image is. Can you see there at the top of these pictures? That is a low density, whereas the bottom is much higher density. And density, the actual definition, is the overall darkness or blackness of an image. And we get a darker density, we get a greater density when we have a greater kilovoltage. The less kilovoltage we use, the lighter the overall image. We can see there at the top, that was a much lighter KVP setting used because that black there, that is where the x-ray beams should have been able to penetrate that tissue and continue straight through based on how much power they had. But they didn't have as much power as they should have. And so even though they're only traveling through tissue here to go to those areas between the teeth where there is no, uh, there's no bone, there's no fillings or anything like that on those in-between areas, that should have been black. But at the bottom, you can see that the, the x-ray beams that traveled through just that soft tissue areas, those just hit the receptor because they were traveling much faster and they penetrated the soft tissue much easier than the ones at the top. Whereas even though you have a very fast penetrating beam on bottom, they're not going to penetrate those areas like uh, where the enamel is and the areas where the silver fillings and things like that. We'll go definitely further into everything that we're seeing on that bottom x-ray there, but I want you to see how we have a very dark black areas and then we have those bright white areas. Whereas at the top, we have all of those shades of gray, even the areas where you know they're bright white, they don't stand out as much because we have all of those other shades of gray that kind of blend it all together. And even those areas where it should be black in between the teeth, those areas aren't. They're kind of a, a very dark shade of gray. And so uh, the shades of gray, the, the more shades of gray you have, the less density you have. Whereas the more, the, the less shades of gray you have, the more density you have. Okay. 
in keeping with those shades of gray concept, the contrast of an image is how sharply dark and light areas are differentiated on an image. So you can see that top picture, there is black and then there is white and there's very few shades of gray. That means it has um, more contrast. More contrast is less shades of gray, okay? Contrast is something you'll definitely see on your boards, definitely, no, no question about that. Um, if you have high caries risk, which is cavities, right? If you wanna make sure you can see cavities really easily on your x-rays, you need that high contrast shades of gray version at the top. But if you want to detect periodontal disease, you wanna see those, those changes in the bone which are much more minute than looking for cavities, then those are things we're going to be looking at on the bottom um, um, shade guide. And that is more shades of gray will tell us more about periodontal disease. The, so anyway, the top picture here is high contrast, which means not a lot of variation. And the bottom picture is um, low contrast, which is a lot of variation. Here we have contrast in relation to kilovoltage. And we have, if we have low kilovoltage settings, then that means we're going to have a high contrast film. It means that the x-rays aren't going to penetrate things they're not supposed to penetrate and, they're not and they are going to penetrate areas that they should. So we have the areas that are just soft tissue. You know, we saw that dark gray on the, on the x-ray. Um, if there's just air space like that, we'll get a nice dark picture. And if there's anything that the x-ray has to penetrate, which it can't because it's not strong enough, then it won't. And so we'll have a lot of white areas. We get a lot of uh, black because of air space, and we get a lot of white because of objects. We don't get a lot of shades of gray. This is good for detecting cavities. Um, this is our range anywhere between 60, 65 to 70 KVP will create this high contrast film. And this is a good thing because we want to be able to see uh, cavities on an x-ray. It's really important to remember that these two things are inversely related, which means a low kilovoltage gives us a high contrast. Contrast and kilovoltage are opposites, okay? So then here, if we have high kilovoltage peak settings, which is over uh, or greater to or equal greater to or more than 90 kvp then it's going to create a low contrast film so here at the bottom we don't see a big difference in between each one of these steps in this step wedge we see a very easy gradual change it's more ombre right so here we see because we see so many shades of gray this is better for the detection for periodontal disease and for periapical disease. We're going to see those more minute changes in the bone density. However, um, we're not going to be able to see uh, cavities quite as easily. And so for this one, it's just important to remember that having a high kilovoltage setting is going to give us a low contrast film. Okay, again, they are inversely related. If one goes up, the other goes down. Okay, so now here we're going to talk about exposure time in relation to kilovoltage. Exposure time is how long those the the X-ray beam is actually um, being created and pointed towards your patient. And so um, exposure time is something you'll definitely see on your board exam. So, so anytime we talk about exposure time, you're going to want to kind of sit up and listen just a little bit. This is the interval time during which x-rays are produced. It's the time that you're holding that button and you're hearing that beep. That's how long this is. It's measured in impulses. Impulses are 1 60th of a second. So just like 60 seconds make up a minute, 60 impulses make up one second. And it is uh, it comes from alternating current, by the way, not just direct current. Any adjustment in the exposure time is going to be necessary if you change your kilovoltage. So um, if you raise your kilovoltage, you're going to need to decrease your exposure time. Just like contrast, they're inversely related. So when we raise our kilovoltage, we have to lower our exposure time. 
and exposure time is measured in impulses because x-rays are created in a series of bursts or pulses rather than in a continuous stream. That's why we're talking about that alternating current. But what I want you to take from this slide is that the more exposure time you have, the less kVp you need. And then uh, on the opposite side, the less exposure time you have, the more kVp that you need in order to get that diagnostic radiograph. Something that's really nice about digital x-rays is that even if we don't get quite the right contrast and you know we don't have quite the right density, those types of changes can actually be made digitally after we take that radiograph. Whereas if we were still taking radiographs using the traditional film, we would actually have to go back and, and take the x-ray again or take the radiograph again on the individual, which um, it really saves our patients a lot of those retakes. All right, so now we have quantity. And the quantity of the beam is how much of those X-ray photons, how many of them there are that are traveling toward our sensor. This is going to be controlled by amperage and milliamperage, and it's going to be measured in ampere seconds. It's going to affect the density, uh, and the exposure time and the milliamperage will both have variables to play. So therefore, quantity of the X-ray beam refers to the number of X-rays produced in the X-ray dental unit. Amperage and milliamperage here. Amperage determines the amount of electrons that pass through the cathode filament. And then by increasing the amperage of those electrons passing through the cathode, uh, passing through the cathode, the tungsten filament that is in the cathode means that we're going to have more of the, those electrons that break off and travel over toward the anode, and then that means that more of them will strike the, the tungsten target in the anode, and then the more x-rays that will be produced. The more x-rays that there are available to penetrate an object, the more dense or dark the radiograph will be. So then here we have a picture of A being amperage, and with the more that we, the um, it's actually like temperature wise, so the more, the hotter a temperature that we pass through that filament there, the more of those little electrons that are going to be created. And that happens in that little electron cloud before we ever even press that exposure button. An ampere is a unit of measure used to describe the number of electrons or the current flowing through the cathode filament. It is measured in milliamperes, which are one one thousandth of an ampere. In dental radiography, amperage ranges from 7 to 15. It's going to be important that you remember that 7 to 15 is the appropriate range. It doesn't mean that's what ours are set on. It just means that that is the range. Both amperage and exposure time have a direct effect on the number of electrons produced by the cathode filament. Older units use 17 to 15, whereas newer units are going to use that 6 to 8 MA. It's generally 7, but you can find those on page 25, that range. Okay, so then I think on that last slide I said the wrong page number. It's actually page 27 that you're going to find those, uh, those milliamperage and uh, x-ray beam quantity uh, information. But you, you probably would have figured that out if you'd gone to look it up. Anyway, um, here we have milliamperage and amperage. Amperage is milliamperage. It regulates the temperature of the cathode filament. So the higher the milliamperage settings, that's going to increase the temperature. When we increase the temperature, it increases the number of electrons that are passing through that filament. And when we increase the number of electrons passing through the filament, we increase the ones that are sent to the anode. And then those increase the number of x-rays that are created. Uh, I want you to remember that milliamperage affects the, the number of electrons or the quantity and kilovoltage affects the quality of the beam or the speed of the beam. Here we're going to have the same sort of interaction with exposure time as we had with kilovoltage. So if we increase milliamperage, then we have to decrease the exposure time in order to get the same sort of density in our images. And the same thing happens if we decrease milliamperage, we would need to increase exposure time. Therefore, milliamperage and kilovoltage are both inversely related with exposure time. So here we can see how milliamperage plays a role in density. If we have a higher milliamperage, it's going to give us an overall more dense 
image than we would with less milliamperage. So therefore, the higher we have the milliamperage, the higher the density. And the lower the milliamperage, the lower the density. Both of these work the same way as kilovoltage, right? If we have a higher kilovoltage, we have a, dark, a more dense image. If we have a lower kilovoltage, we have a less dense image. The same thing happens with milliamperage. So this slide is a repeat of the last thing too. The exposure time and the milliamperage have an inverse relationship, which means that when one goes up, the other needs to go down. So when we increase our milliamperage, we decrease the exposure time. And when we decrease our milliamperage, we increase our exposure time. So this one talks about exposure factors, all three of them together. The things that we can change on our x-ray machines. We have kilovoltage, milliamperage, and exposure time. Now, here on the x-ray units that we have at Concord, this one, we cannot change our milliamperage. Milliamperage is set right at seven because it is a newer unit that gives us that proper range between six and eight milliamperage. And when you cannot change the setting, it will be posted on your dental x-ray machine unit. And so there, right underneath the seconds, we see 7MA. We can't change that. The only thing we can change on this one of the, the two of those that you know you really shouldn't be messing around with is kilovoltage. And so here we can choose either a 70 kilovoltage or a 60 kilovoltage. And then the other thing is that when we, as we go around and we choose those different pictures of teeth, each one of those corresponds with which type of x-ray intraorally that we're going to be taking. And then you can see that little picture right next to the kilovoltage one. That one has a one little tiny person and one big person. That's the difference between an adult and a child. And so when we have that one, we would, we would choose the other x-ray because we want to reduce our exposure time. So the only one that affects the kilovoltage is that one button that actually says kilovoltage. All of the rest of those buttons will affect our exposure time. And anytime we change one of these settings, we're going to change the number or the, the speed of which our x-ray beams are traveling toward our patient. And then that is going to affect the image that we get. So we need to be mindful of the type of image that we want and using the correct settings so that we get the image that we're looking for. So now we're going to get into something called intensity. And if you think about it completely separate from the word density, right, we have how intense our image is, our x-ray beam is, how, how much of the x-rays we have and how much penetrating power that they have. So this is going to be affected by the kilovoltage, by the milliamperage, by the exposure. But now we need to look at the distance for how far away from our patient that our tungsten target is. And then we have to think about, um, because of distance, how far away we are, that's going to affect how intense the beam is once it reaches our patient. And then remember how inside the tube head we had those uh, aluminum filters? Those will also play a role in how intense our beam is. And we're gonna get into each of these. All right, so X-ray beam intensity. This is the product of the quantity, of which is the number of X-ray photons, and the quality, which is the energy of each photon, per unit of area, per unit of time of exposure. So there at the bottom we have the intensity equals the number of photons times the energy of each photon, which is all going to be divided over the area times exposure rate. I'm not going to ask you to compute any of these. I'm just, I just want you to be aware that each one of these factors, which is on the right hand side, is going to affect the overall intensity of our x-ray beam. Just like our kilovoltage peak. It regulates the penetrating power of the x-ray beam by controlling the speed of electrons traveling between the cathode and the anode. The higher kilovoltage peak we have, the more energy and the shorter wavelengths that our x-ray beams will have. And then it increases the intensity of the x-ray beam. Again, our milliamperage, which controls the penetrating power of the x-ray beam by controlling the number of electrons produced in the x-ray tube and the number of x-ray protons that are produced. Photons, not protons, my goodness. Higher milliamperage settings will produce an x-ray beam with more energy because it has more 
uh, electrons and because it has more of those x-ray photons, which is going to increase the intensity of the x-ray beam. The exposure affects our intensity because the longer that we are shooting those x-rays towards the patient, that means that we are going to essentially send more x-ray photons toward our patient. Just like milliamperage affects the number, exposure time affects the number. The longer we're shooting those x-rays, the more x-rays we're going to shoot, right? That's just common sense. So the longer the exposure time, it's going to create more x-rays, and we're going to have a more intense x-ray beam. This is measured in impulses. Remember that one, an impulse is 60, 1 60th of a second. There are 60 impulses in one second. Exposure time, just like milliamperage, affects the number of x-ray. So here's the one we haven't talked about yet. This one is distance. How far away from something we are shooting those x-rays is going to affect how intense or how strong the x-rays are once they reach the thing that we're shooting them at. So here we have three different types of of distances that we need to think about. We have from the target surface to the um, from the target to the surface of whatever it is we're doing. So here we can see the anode. The anode is our, always our starting point. So even though we have all of that distance of our PID and we have those different types of PIDs, which we'll get into more later, um, we still need to go as far as distance wise, we're measuring from where the anode is to this, in this case, to the surface skin. The very first time that those x-ray beams come into contact with matter other than air. That target to surface distance. Then we have the target to the object distance. Object is whatever it is we're trying to take the x-ray of. So in this case, and in, in most cases in the dental office, your target to object distance is between from the anode to the tooth that we're trying to capture the image of. And then we also have the target to receptor distance. And so this will get into more into play when we start talking about the different techniques that we use to take x-rays, because sometimes we'll increase the distance between the tooth and the receptor, and sometimes we'll shorten the distance between the tooth and the receptor. So this is an important factor to keep in mind when we're talking about the intensity of the beam because not only does that beam have to travel from the target to the anode, it has to travel, I'm not sorry, from the anode to the tooth. We also have to think about how far it has to travel once from the tooth to the receptor. You can hear my cat, he's trying to get into the door. Um, the target to receptor distance is our third distance that we want to keep in mind. As x-rays travel from from wherever it is they start, which is, is, is always going to be the tungsten target, which is in the anode, they're going to diverge. And what's nice about the x-ray tube head is that it is lead lined. And so all of the x-rays, as they kind of spread out, they get then filtered down and more focal, uh, more for more focused um, as they exit the PID because of the, the PID and because of the lead collimator and because of the, the unleaded glass window. Remember, like as they travel out of that little tiny sliver of space that they're allowed to leave the tube head because of, they will travel toward wherever it is you're pointing them. But the more, the further away that they have to go, the more that they're going to spread out. And the further that they go, the more that they spread out, that means that instead of having all of your x-rays hitting one single spot, we now have your x-rays hitting um, a wider area of space. And that is going to reduce our intensity because instead of being focused and honed in on one little spot, and putting all of our x-rays into that spot, we now have a much wider space that they're all encompassing. And so that is why we have this inverse square law. You could very well see this on your board exams. An inverse square law is as those x-rays are spreading out, that means that each each point is go not going to be as intense. So if we double the distance, that means that we're only going to get one fourth as intense as we would have if we hadn't doubled the distance. If we triple the distance, it's going to be one ninth. Basically, we're going to square however far away it is that we have, and that will be um, the inverse relationship or the reciprocal of the, the number that we have. So 
it's going to be proportional to the distance. And so if we keep our distance constant, then we never have to think about the inverse square law. But then if we maybe double our distance, then we're going to have one fourth. If we uh, triple our distance, we're going to have one ninth. If we quadruple our distance, we're going to have uh, one sixteenth. And so it's important to remember that the further away from the uh, the receptor, the further away from the tooth, the further away from the surface contact, that's going to lower our intensity. And here is an image of what we're talking about there. So see how from the source to that first one, that's good. all of our all of our X-rays are now focused on that one little spot, that one square. But then if we double that distance, now our X-rays have spread out to four times as much space. And so that is why we have one fourth of the intensity of each of those uh, squares. And then if we go a third, uh, I'm sorry even more, we go, you know, a third, three times as far, then we're now spreading our beam out to those nine squares. And that means our intensity in each of those squares is only one ninth as much as it was in our one square. And then as we go um, that fourth number, four times the distance, then now we have that space is much wider and we're spreading those x-rays out even more. And so we only have one sixteenth of that space and of that intensity. The inverse square law is kind of, of confusing, but if you really look at that picture and you're really trying to take the time to get to understand it, I think that it will start to make sense because those x-ray beams are spreading out. But now we're going to get into the half value layer. And the half value layer has a lot to do with those aluminum filters that are inside that tube head seal and they are going to filter out the lower energy, less penetrating, longer wavelengths. And what we need to know is the aluminum filters are placed in the path of the beam. The filters remove that low energy, less penetrating, longer wavelengths, um, and it increases the mean penetrating capacity of the x-ray beam that does escape, right? Because that means that only the good ones are getting through. The thickness of that specified material is going to be the one that reduces the intensity by half. So here you can see 1.5 millimeters aluminum filtration, right? That means that for this x-ray machine, 1.5 millimeters is what we needed in order to reduce the intensity of the beam by half. If, for instance, we had an x-ray unit where it said 3 millimeters aluminum, that would mean that the half value layer of this aluminum, of, of this tube head, would be three. But whatever it says the half value layer is, that is what it takes to reduce the intensity by half. Okay, that's all you really have to know about that. If you have questions, please, please, please post them in the question and answer discussion board. Um, I would really encourage you, as, if you have questions as we go, to mark down what slide maybe you had the question on, then you can go back and look at it. That way you can remember all of those questions because I know, you know you're not able to raise your hand and just ask in the middle of the presentations, but I, I definitely want to answer your questions. So if you have them, please, please, please write them down. The next thing you can do is obviously send me an email or you can just wait until you see me in lab and we can discuss any of these things that you guys need to, okay?